As you may know, my name is Mara Walsh, and I'm a travel enthusiast, a group leader, a travel agent. I've been supporting the tour guides who've been out of work during this pandemic with hosting these virtual tour presentations. These presentations are provided with a tip as you wish model. So if you have the means and you can send a tip to the tour guides, it is much appreciated. I'm thrilled that so many of you have found value on these virtual tours each week and they have reignited your desire to travel. They've connected you with regions all over the world. I love the fact that they've not only kept you occupied, but they've connected you with family and friends as you watch these tours in your homes with your families and friends or on the internet texting them back and forth. It warms my heart to know that you guys look forward to these each week, and we certainly believe that it's a pleasure to present them to you. And that's why I made a point to find a fun event um, that you will hopefully enjoy this week in lieu of our postponed tour. We've done more than 30 tours in the last um, year since COVID struck. I'm gonna put a list of the future tours up so that you can see them. Um, Belgium, Portugal, Mystery on the Danube, South of France, Ancient Rome, Sydney, Australia, Wales and Cornwall, Taj Mahal, Venice, Western Scotland, and our postponed tour of Jerusalem will come back in August. Feel free to ask questions that relate to the tour in the Q&A. You can chat me and I will try to converse with you during the event. Um, I usually do an interactive poll and I'm gonna try to put that up right now for everybody. And it's what's your connection to Argentina and Chile? I live in that region. I've been there and love it. I haven't been, but I have a trip plans. I may consider going in the future or I'm only interested and it's in, in, in experiencing it virtually. I'm not gonna take a lot of time to get all of the responses, but I'm gonna end the poll results. It looks like a lot of people are considering to visit it in the future. About 50%, which is great. So if Carlos and Laura do a great job today, maybe we'll see some more tourists uh, in your region. I'm gonna stop sharing that. And if it does not disappear from your screen, please hit the red button on the top left corner to get rid of it. Um, this virtual tour presentation should be 90 minutes plus a Q&A. It will be a little bit shorter because I'm speaking shorter and I know the presentation is shorter than our normal presentations. So hopefully you have a snack or a drink and you're hunkered down ready to go. Um, back by popular demand is uh, our friends, Laura and Carlos, who brought us the amazing Last Continent tour of Antarctica last month. Today, they're here to show you a little bit about their countries and hopefully teach you some fun facts and some interesting tidbits. Um, Laura and Carlos, if you're ready, you can come on, say hola to our friends, and I'm going to hand over the event to you as quickly as I can so that I can go and deal with the uh, people who are emailing to get a link to get in. Welcome, my friends. Welcome back. And if you're ready, uh, I'm going to hand you. it over to Carlos. I know you're going to be sharing your screen. So if you want to just try that while I'm here um, and make Bye. sure that we are set before I disappear and go answer emails. How are you all doing? Thank you again for coming on so quickly. I know that this was short notice. Laura and I were talking about this, what, yesterday morning, I think, yeah. Laura, and we decided yeah. to uh, <laughs> put this all together. Yeah, we wanna thank you again, Mara. We wanna say hi to all our virtual friends out there. Um, I am, this time we are not together. Carlos is in Santiago de Chile, and I am in Buenos Aires, Argentina. For family reasons, I had to come here uh, three weeks ago. So we hope this works uh, perfectly. You know, we um, trust on excellent Wi-Fi connections and Carlos will be sharing the screen, but we will both uh, be talking about each of our countries. So we thank you for being here. And um, if audio is correct and it's working fine, I think we can, we can start. Okay, so yeah, this is our first slide of our presentation. Uh, it's about our two countries, Argentina and Chile. This would be more like an overview of all these cool facts and curiosities. Um, we are not getting into a lot of detail, but we want to tell you fun stuff about our countries. Some of you maybe were here already, so maybe you will remember some of the places that we will be, we will be mentioning. 
And for the ones of you who have never been here, we really hope this gets your interest and attention and you will be very welcome if you wanna come here in the future. So we can start um, as I usually like to do this with maps. So we are moving on to the next, the first slide of our presentation. That's a map of the world. And those are our two countries highlighted in red. Then on the next map, we will see our two countries. And like you know, we say we live close to Antarctica. So Antarctica is also marked in there. And our third map will be to show you each of our countries. In my case, Argentina is the green country. It's the eighth largest country in the world. And as you can see there, Buenos Aires city is the capital of my country that has about 45 million inhabitants. But you have to know that 35% of those inhabitants live in the city of Buenos Aires and surroundings. Um, so yeah, here I am in the city of Buenos Aires and Carlos would like to introduce his country. Uh, hi everyone, it's good to be connected again. Uh, my, um, I'm representing a, a, a very skinny piece of land uh, located in the southwest corner of South America. In other words, right next to the Andes Range right there and, uh, and by uh, Argentina. And um, uh, Chile is, is um, like I said, very long and right in the center of the, of the country is where we have Santiago, the capital city. That's where I am currently. And um, we have a population of 18 million, one eight uh, in the whole country. And just about a third of, of it, it's concentrated in, in, in Santiago and, and outskirts as well. So well, let's start with a few facts about my country, Argentina. Let's start with this little guy that as you can read, it's called in English, the Rufus Ornero. Ornero is a Spanish name of this little bird. Maybe you know in Spanish, we write the H, but we don't pronounce it. So Ornero, uh, this is our national bird in Argentina. It's been chosen as a national bird in 1928. And it was because of a survey that a popular newspaper together with the Argentinians Bird Association put together. And the people chose from many different birds in the country. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see that there were colorful birds, huge birds, and this tiny brown guy was chosen because it's present in many different parts of the country. As you can read, it's eight inches uh, tall. And the name Ornero comes from the word in Spanish that it's horno, and horno means oven. And it's because a special feature of this bird is that they built these rounded nests that they resemble an old um, firewood oven. So um, these rounded nests, they can weigh up to 10 pounds. They build it with adobe, so mud and little branches. So they always need to be close to the water and they can take both male and female work on the nest from six to 15 days to build one. They have a separate chamber inside the nest where they incubate the eggs. The reason for this is that they want to protect their future babies from the predators and they keep the same nest for one year and then they just move around in the vicinity and build a new one. Before we move on, I wanted to listen to this Ornero's call. So we go from this bird to the national flower, this beautiful bright red flower. It's a tree that is called Sabo or Coxpur coral tree. The Latin name of this tree that grows not only in Argentina, but in many of our neighboring countries in South America, the first part is Eritrina, and that comes from the Greek and means coral tree or red color. It was chosen as our national flower in 1941, and it blooms between November and February. The next picture you will see was taken in a very nice and popular place in the middle of the city of Buenos Aires, that is a famous rose garden. So you can see the roses in the background, but the tree, the sabo that has a really crooked trunk. So that's the national flower of Argentina. And now we move on to our national stone. But if you were here, maybe you bought something that is made of this stone. 
We call it rodocrosita, which for English speaking people, it's hard to pronounce and to remember, but we also call it the Inca Rose. And I wanna translate this for you. Uh, it's called Inca Rose because it was extracted from the stone walls that surrounded the Inca empire. And the legend says that this stone represents peace, love, and pardon. The strongest red or strongest pink variety is of course the most expensive one and the best quality one as well. And the name Rodocrosita comes from the Greek word rhodos and means pink color. Now I wanna show you the area in Argentina where we can find this stone. You can see on the map with a bright red color, Northwest region of my country, there's a province that is equal to the states in the US that is called Catamarca. There are several mines in there, but the one that is called Capichitas mine is the largest, uh, not only here, but it's believed to be the world's largest mass of rhodocrosite. Doing some research, I couldn't find out that it looks like in Russia and parts of the US, Colorado and Montana, there are some rhodocrosita deposits. And this one produces from 100 up to 200 tons of material per year. The next picture will show you how the stone looks like. And whenever you come to Argentina, not only in the capital, Buenos Aires, but in some other touristic destinations, you can easily find, even in the artisan fairs, different pieces of jewelry, for example, that they are made with the rodocrosita, or also some ornaments like a tiny penguin can also be a pink penguin because it's made with it. So this is Argentina's national stone. All right, let's see something about uh, Chile this time. That's the country's coat of arms, and you see two animals there. The one on the left is the deer, and probably you're wondering, yeah, you, how come you have a deer in your coat of arms? Well, that's because we have only two deers endemic to South America. One of them is the Wemul. That's precisely what you see uh, in it. And the other is a very small one that we'll talk about later. And Laura will, will, will show us uh, yeah, some pictures and videos of it. Now, let's now pay attention to the, the bird. The bird is the condor. So the Andean condor is... Uh, it's a, um, the Chilean national bird and it's also has also been embraced by other countries, uh, neighboring countries like Colombia and, and Bolivia, for instance. Now, one thing we need to mention about this bird is that um, it's, um, yeah, it's a lot, the, the, the longest, the biggest uh, um, flying bird uh, on our planet uh, by combining uh, the, um, two measurements, the weight and the wingspan. The wingspan is about 10 feet and the weight, it's roughly 30 pounds. So it's a big bird and it actually roots uh, very, very high up in the Andes range above 16,000 feet uh, in level of elevation. And it lays one egg every two years. So, and the reproductive cycle is very, very slow. Uh, fortunately, it's been pretty successful. It has its cousin, the California bird, a uh, condor, uh, and uh, it, which is slightly smaller than, than the Andean. And there you are, a full grown adult. That's the picture you see. So it's our national bird. Now, um, what about um, national flower? And that is the copihue, which comes from uh, an indigenous word that stands for uh, mouth down uh, kind of shaped uh, you know, flower. It looks like a bell flower. Everybody calls it the bell flower. Now, what is interesting uh, to mention about this flower is that where it grows in Chile, it grows in the so-called patches of temperate rainforest that we have. And that's uh, located on, on parallel 40 to 41 latitude south. And, uh, and it's been raised uh, as our national, uh, national flower for many, many years as well. It's, um, in a, it's very waxy texture and and um and really beautiful and it, and it blooms in two different colors three different colors sorry pink white and red all right so the rotocrosite or inca roses to argentina what lapis lazuli is to chile we have actually two um mines there are actually two mines in the world one is in afghanistan which i think is no longer in operation so at least it's been for the last 10 years according to my updated information. So therefore the only uh, lapis lastly mines uh, working, currently working is called Flor de los Andes. 
and it's situated above 11,000 feet uh, deep in the Andes. You can see in the map um, highlighted uh, in red, uh, the uh, region, because Chile is divided into regions, not states or provinces, but regions. Um, and um, and uh, you see where the little star is, if you zoom in, the exact location of Lapis Lazuli. So every visitor uh, to Chile, of course, they, if you're very much into ornament, ornaments in general or jewelry, this is what you get. Uh, you know, the bluer it is, the bluer, the, 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 the higher the quality, and, and it's really uh, kind of expensive, but sometimes you can, you can bargain here and, and get one or two nice little ornamental pieces uh, to take back home. So now coming back to Argentina, we'll talk a bit about food and drinks. So in my country, the national drink is the wine, any wine that is produced here. So 2010 was a year when uh, one of our presidents by a decree declared the wine as the national drink of Argentina. And I understand this only happens here, that the wine is the national drink of a country. So November 24th, we celebrate the Argentine's Wine Day. So on the map, you can see in a kind of dark red, brownish color, the parts of Argentina where wine is produced. So it's basically along the west side, northwest, central west, and also the bottom part uh, where you see two different parts, like from west to east marked, that's the northern part of the region that we call Patagonia. So all those areas produce different kind of wine varieties. We will talk about the main two uh, options or the most important wines on the next slide. So for the first one, that it's our emblematic white wine, to pronounce it, you have to roll your R. So it's Torrontes, that's how we call it. And we can say it's the only 100% native uh, grape or Torrontes grape is the only native one in Argentina among all the wines that we produce. It was brought, I mean, it was grow, grew during the colonial times. Uh, there were two different white grapes that were introduced. And because of this mix, this hybrid appeared. So we started growing it. And basically now Argentina produces all the Torrontes, except for a little production in Chile and in Peru. That's about white wines. But now, of course, I'm sure you've heard about the Argentinian Malbec. We say that Argentina saved Malbec wine because it was just a minor grape in France. And in the middle of the 1800s, a French botanist introduced the grape in one of the Argentinian provinces. And because it was spread throughout the country and in the wine region, it became more and more popular. So nowadays it represents three quarters of the Argentinian wine production. So you can still that France still produces some, but Malbec is the most famous of the Argentinian wines that we have. We'll see a few more pictures about wines. Uh, the Malbec was basically introduced in one province that we can say it's the main wine producing province of the country. That's how the landscapes look, look like. And the province name is Mendoza. So the high mountains, and that's where in the vicinity is where the vineyards grow and have been growing for years. This is alcohol, but now we will talk about something different that could also be considered as a national drink because as soon as you arrive in Argentina, you see it everywhere. So this is called mate, not mate, mate. That's the, white, the right way to pronounce it. So it's a kind of tea that we drink in a different way the herbs that you see on the picture are called sherba mate, and that comes from a tree that grows in the northeast area of Argentina in one specific province that is called Misiones, but that tree also grows in Brazil and in Paraguay. So as you can see, we use a container that in general it's a gourd and one straw. That straw, we share it with family or friends when we are drinking. Of course, since the pandemic started, we had to stop doing this, but that was maybe the weird or the weirdest part when people from outside Argentina, they look at us drinking mate. The next photo will show you a very famous Argentinian drinking mate. So the Pope 
loves mate and that was offered by some Argentinians when he was walking and driving around the Vatican. So Argentina is the first producer of yerba mate in the world and here wherever you go from a tiny grocery store, little convenience store to big supermarket chains, you can easily buy a package of yerba mate. So the next photo will show you like all sorts of uh, different uh, brands of yerba mate that we produce and you can easily buy. You can drink mate any time of the day. And November 30th, it looked like November is the month to celebrate in Argentina. It's the yerba mate national day. On the map, you can see the countries that import yerba mate from Argentina. And maybe you will be surprised that Syria and Lebanon they take almost 52%. And that's because some people from those countries, they were immigrants at a point in Argentina and they took the mate as a habit. So when they went back to their countries, they still drink mate. And also Chile imports almost an 8% because um, the Patagonian side, the Southern part of Chile also adopted this tradition of drinking mate. And when it comes to sweets, this is my favorite one. We call this alfajor, and it looks like the original recipe came from Andalusia in the 1800s. But of course, over the years, it really changed. And what an alfajor means to us here is what you see on the picture. Two cookies, and in between, dulce de leche. Maybe you've heard of this. Dulce de leche is our local version of caramel. It's thicker and I like it better. It can be covered with dark chocolate uh, or just with sugar, as you can see on the picture with powdered sugar. So alfajores are produced everywhere in the country. Argentina is the first producer. Um, it's estimated that 6 million alfajores are eaten per day in my country. And you can buy them like the mate everywhere. You go to a little kiosk around the corner or to a duty-free shop at the airports and you can easily find alfajores. So on the next picture, you will see some of the many brands that you can get. Uh, the most famous brand is called Havana, starting with H. And I know that even in some airports in the US, like Miami, you can find those. So I just love alfajores, like everybody in Argentina. I just ate one before starting the presentation. There oh, you lucky you. I need to go yes. and get one. Okay, so let's go from something uh, sweet into something rather strong and very enjoyable, especially for cocktail hours. So is it cocktail hour yet? So pay attention. This is Pisco Sour, and but let's just go uh, with the, the history a little bit. Pisco, the word itself, comes from a small town in, a, in the southern Peru. That's where it all started. And they, they started first actually making pisco there and they still produce pisco. But Chile has adopted that and brought it into the, what we call the little north or the, uh, the, the, which is basically the very beginning of the Atacama Desert as highlighted on the map there on the left side. We use two kinds of grapes, Moscatel and Alejandria. Those two uh, are basically uh, used to make some, uh, some, some uh, quality, high quality wine and then you distill it. So it is, it's a, the process of distillation, you get very strong and pure alcohol that can go from 20% up to, listen to this, 60%, six zero. So you could have it actually plain, like it shows right there on those bottles. More than 28 100 Pisco grapes producer are concentrated between the regions of Atacama and Coquimbo that are highlighted in blue on the map on the left side. In 2016, so you have a rough idea, exports totaled 2.7 million US dollars. And the main markets, pay attention, US, Argentina, and Germany. So probably if you go into your uh, nearest uh, liquor store and ask for Pisco, you could have a Pisco as, as you would probably like to have your scotch on the rocks just plain, it's very strong, but anyways, people like it. And you see, uh, it looks kind of brownish. And there's another bottle right in the center, looks more transparent. Well, but if you want to actually make it into a nice sour drink for your cocktail hour and to get something like this on the in the picture, um, you need to have ideally with you some lime. If you don't have lime juice, I mean, uh, lemon would, would do it. 
And um, you need to add also some powdered sugar, some uh, egg white to get the foam you see on top of the, the glass right there. You put it in the refrigerator for two hours or so, and then you serve it ice cold. And there you are, the Chilean national drink, Pisco Sour. Okay, let's just stay within the same subject, grapes and wine. And obviously, the, for, to many people around the world, the wine making tradition, it, it's a very, very important to Chileans. And, and it, it's a matter of, uh, uh, it's a reason, uh, it's a matter of pride as well. And uh, the Vitis vinifera, which was the very first kind of grape introduced by the conquistadores, the Spanish settlers and in the early 1500s, towards the 1500s, um, the, um, it was um, uh, quickly spread around and, and, and due to the magnificent conditions we have, the soil and, and the, uh, uh, the isolation of the country and uh, also the absence of uh, bugs and, and, uh, and diseases and stuff like that. So it made uh, the Chilean uh, wine uh, uh, business very competitive around the world. We produce Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Carmenere. Now, where do they come from? Where exactly in Chile? And this is zoomed in map and where you see uh, I can, uh, the Aconcagua region, Central Valley region and South region. So this is basically central Southern portion of the country, which is also our main growing uh, area uh, for, the, for, the, for Chile. And um, we have beautiful valleys that would extend all the way from the Andes range down to the Pacific coast and, uh, and, uh, and I want to just, just talk about uh, and it's very uh, specific and distinctive um, grape. Maybe you've heard about this, maybe you haven't. And if you haven't, please take note because, you know, Carmenere is today what it is, what Malbec it is to Argentinians or Sinfondel to Americans and maybe uh, Shiraz to Australians. So it's become the uh, distinctive wine for Chilean, uh, um, um, you know, uh, business and, um, the story says that back in 1977 to 79 in Europe, this Carmenere was devastated along, uh, along with several other uh, grapes and vineyards by phylloxera. And those of you who live in California may actually heard of this. Uh, Chile, is, it's, it's, uh, it's classified as a country phylloxera free. So it's basically an aphid or a little bug that eats the vine's roots. So that happened in, towards the uh, end of the 70s, 1970s in Europe. So, and um, wine uh, vineyards were, sorry, uh, wine, uh, vineyards, yes, uh, were uh, devastated and it was thought Carbonaire has gone forever. But 20 years later, or less actually than 20 years, um, uh, in mid 1990s, 96, uh, 95, 96, um, and in Chile, uh, they uh, released this breaking news to the, to the business. The Carmenere was alive and Carmenere has been rediscovered in Chile and uh, without knowing, of course, for that long time, we didn't know we had Carmenere in, in, in Chile. It was actually found uh, uh, growing in, in, the, in a Merlot uh, field. And, uh, and of course, uh, soon after that, uh, Chile became the first producer of Carmenere in the world. And uh, like I said before, it's a, an excellent wine and you should try it. Something between Cabernet and Merlot. All right, let's, let's talk about something different this time. Uh, the, uh, you need to roll the R to pronounce properly this, uh, this name, Marraquetas. And um, I hope you're trying that uh, at home. Anyways, um, there's a story behind this. The most accepted it is that the uh, uh, um, uh, two brothers from French brothers uh, came came uh, to the, the, the to Chile and settled down in the harbor city of Valparaiso off the, the coast uh, and 80, 80 miles from where I am. And uh, in the middle of the 19th century, and they, they brought, of course, this uh, bread making tradition with them. And uh, the Marraquetas, as, as we call them, uh, that was the family name. Uh, and, um, it, you know, uh, led, into, led uh, into Chile, uh, led Chile into becoming the second uh, biggest uh, consumer of bread in the world after Germany in 2019, as it says right there, with about 198 pounds. Per, uh, per person per year. And there you are, 
you know, with this wonderful toasty, crispy, you know, marraquetas that if you ever come to Chile, you should try it with uh, melted butter, but more importantly, some smashed avocado. It's just delicious. All right, moving on, Chilean fruits. Um, you get in the States and as well as in Canada, in, in Mexico, in, in, in North America in general, you get a lot of fruits from Chile. Chile is one of the largest fruit exporters in the world, sending more than 2.6 million tons of fruit annually to more than 100 countries across, across the globe. Thanks to Chile's counter seasonal harvest, the world has access to a variety of fresh fruits year round, from citrix to berries. And you see again on the map, you know, where uh, those places are in relation to, uh, to where I'm uh, currently in Santiago. So um, as a matter of fact, I, I live just a mile away from a vineyard and maybe uh, 15 miles away from the main uh, growing area of, uh, of my country. This was the first full summer I spent in Santiago de Chile. And I can tell you, I think I ate more fruits this past summer than in my whole life. So I really enjoy those Chilean fruits. So back in Argentina, this is the De La Plata River. It's the river that we share in Argentina with Uruguay, and it's considered to be the widest river in the world. As you can read down below, it's 137 miles from coast to coast, uh, the widest part. So that map shows you the coast of Argentina, Buenos Aires being the main port in this river, and then Montevideo, the capital of Uruguay, it's on the other side. We will show you next a video that will play Carlos could take this from the plane when he was about to land one of the many times he landed in Buenos Aires. So that's the view from the plane. You can see the river and also the city of Buenos Aires. There are two companies that offer a ferry. If you wanna go for the day to Uruguay from Buenos Aires, you can go to the capital of Uruguay or also to a little town called Colonia that is pretty interesting. Or also you can stay as long as you want. That's the port of Buenos Aires uh, city. And that's why Buenos Aires was always so important for Argentina because it was a main port of the country. Uh, so this port, it's important because talking about tourism, the next picture will show you better the port area. So this is where the large cruise ships like Princess, Holland America, Royal Caribbean, they normally come except for this past summer because of the pandemic, but they usually start or finish the trips in Buenos Aires when they are going around the southern tip of South America. So this is the port where people can fly in and board the ships right there. Why this river in the world? So we go from the river to an avenue that it's called Nueve de Julio, 9th of July. It was named after Argentina's Independence Day in the year 1816. So you can see the White Avenue. It used to be the widest in the world. Uh, it has 14 lanes that you can see in the middle. The central part of the avenue nowadays has four spe special lanes for public buses. So that's uh, what you see in the middle and then 10 lanes on the sides for cars and taxis. But then it adds four lanes on each side of parallel streets. So it measures 360 feet wide. That's equal to an entire city block, our city blocks in Buenos Aires. Uh, it was built between 1930s and 1980s. And there were several buildings that had to be demolished because it was getting wider and wider. And it runs for about 1.5, 1.9 miles. But I told you, it used to be the widest avenue. So why did I say this? And it's because as you can see this next picture, it's a place called Monumental Access and that's in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil. So since 2006, it looks like this place stole this title of widest avenue, according to the Guinness Book of World Records. This street is about 820 feet wide. Anyway, my opinion, I like Brazilians, but I think this is more, it looks more like a park than a wider avenue, so I still like our 9th of July. And I wanna share with you a video that was taken with a drone. It was published uh, by a, an important newspaper of Argentina. So you can see the symbol 
of the avenue and also a symbol of Argentina, that it's the obelisk that is 220 feet tall and it was inaugurated to commemorate the 400 years after the foundation of Buenos Aires city, the first foundation in the year 1536. The obelisk is located in the middle of 9th of July Avenue in the intersection with another avenue that is called Corrientes, that is, we call it like the little Broadway of Buenos Aires because many theaters are along that place. So the obelisk is the central point of the city of Buenos Aires for several protests. Also, when we celebrate something, we all gather there. So that was 9th of July Avenue. Now, we move to the newest neighborhood of the city of Buenos Aires. It was added as neighborhood 48 in the city in the year 1989. As you can see, it's marked on that little map in red. It's right on the shore of the river. You can also see uh, on the picture down below the river that we just mentioned, De La Plata. When this neighborhood was inaugurated, they reclaimed part of those lands to the river. Now, the main feature of Puerto Madero neighborhood is that it's one of the only neighborhoods in the world where every single street has a woman's name. Different important women, artists, activists, politicians, some native women. And the main symbol of this neighborhood, it's a bridge that it's called as the woman's bridge. It was designed by a famous Spanish architect, Santiago Calatrava, and it was inaugurated in 1991. Now you have to use your imagination because it's pretty abstract, but he said that when he designed this bridge, the woman's bridge, he was trying to represent a couple dancing tango. I think it's pretty easy to see that. So that's a beautiful area. It's the fanciest and the most expensive neighborhood of Buenos Aires city right now, Puerto Madero. Now, again, and only within the city of Buenos Aires is where we have the metro system. Only Buenos Aires city in all Argentina has a metro system. You can see in different colors, the six different lines. The first one was the light blue colored one. And it was in 1913 when the first metro stations or subway stations were inaugurated. Um, it became not only the first metro system in South America, but the first one in the Southern Hemisphere and the first one in the Spanish speaking world because the Madrid uh, metro in, uh, in Spain was inaugurated some years later. As you can read down below, subte is how we call the subway. It comes from the word subterráneo, that means underground. So you need to look for that word subte when you are in the city, if you are looking for a station. We will check some of the pictures now of the first years of the subway, how the stations looked like and the brand new stations. Uh, once in a while, a brand new station, it's inaugurated. And also let's have a look at how the carts were in the past and how the new ones look like nowadays. As I mentioned before, of all the population of Argentina, 45 million, 35% live here in the city of Buenos Aires and surroundings. This means that the subway is used every day uh, by more than 1 million people. Again, it's only in the city of Buenos Aires. So then if you come from the outskirts, you can combine with trains or public buses. So if you are in the city and you wanna look for a specific station, this is how you ID or identify the stations. That a yellow circle that says subway and then colors and letters for the different um, lines. Okay, so that's the first metro system in South America was here in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Now let's talk about something different also in the city of Buenos Aires. This impressive big building is called Teatro Colón. It's the Buenos Aires Opera House. It's a very well-known theater. Um, it was built for almost 20 years and finally opened in that specific location in the year 1908. So during the 20th century, all the most famous and important dancers, singers, orchestras have performed here. So according to National Geographic, it was, it is one of the 10 best opera houses in the world. And it's always among the five best because of its acoustics. 
every people, everybody who plays there, they always say something about the acoustics. That's the main hall, as you can see it right in the central part of the slide. And also a few years ago, uh, an Italian tourism site said that in their opinion, it was the most important opera house in the world. When you come to the city, sometimes you can buy tickets to see a performance, but if there are no performances available, you can always opt, um, opt for a guided visit. They last for about 50 minutes and they take you to see different parts of um, the, the opera house. So they are quite interesting. And before leaving uh, this part of Argentina, again, in Buenos Aires city, I have to mention something about bookstores. Buenos Aires, according to a study that was done in 2014, it's the number one city in the world because of the number of bookstores. As you can read on the slide, there are 25 bookstores every 100,000 people. So the total number 467, even though I'm not quite sure about that number now because we are suffering the pandemic a lot and several um, small businesses, they went bankrupt. And it's followed by Hong Kong and Madrid as some other cities with many bookstores. But if I talk about bookstores, I have to show you this one, El Ateneo Grand Splendid. It's one of the most beautiful and is the largest in South America. El Ateneo, it's a famous company of books, bookstore in Argentina, but they bought this building that was a theater and was opened in 1917. So for many years, it was open as a theater and also a radio station. We will have a look at this video. So you'll see the building from outside. It has apartments uh, up above, but right at the street level, you can read Grand Splendid. They kept the name of the old theater. And then Ateneo, this bookstore company, uh, bought the place and opened it in the year 2000. So you go inside and they stock in there more than 120,000 books. It's amazing. But of course, they kept the original style of the building. So they kept the original dome and they added some modern touches like the escalators. But also they took good advantage of the stage that you will see right now. So in the stage, it's where there's a little cafeteria. So you can grab a book, go for lunch, have a coffee, talk with some friends. So it's a must. If you're in the city, locals go in pretty often. But if you just have some free time in the city of Buenos Aires, I highly recommend that you go in and have a look. All right, let's go back to Chile for a while. And, and uh, you see two flags that look so much alike. They're almost identical. I hope anybody uh, from Texas is watching this presentation. And, um, and, you know, a lot of people, even uh, renowned people have actually mistaken them uh, pretty often. It's a little bit of history uh, of the two flags. Uh, first of all, I want to say, even though they look alike, they're different. Uh, if you pay attention to Texas flag, the, the blue part comes all the way down and in and, and, and a more rectangular shape. And then the lone star goes right in the center there, whereas Chile's flag on the right uh, it's just it's more like a little square it's just halfway down the blue part at least but the colors are the same the colors are identical and um, only the, the Chile's, Chile's flag was first used um, in 1817 1817 uh, some 20 years uh, before or earlier than Texas so yes Chile is, is got first uh, right there Okay, um, since we're talking about Chile, uh, let's have a look of the narrowest country um, in the world and how narrow it is. So let's uh, first see where the, the exact location of a country is. There it is on the southwest corner of South America, that little, uh, it looks like a little red line there, right? And if you look on the, on the map on the right, you can see again um, that uh, the Chile has it's uh, head in the in the heater and stay on the freezer because and it goes through so many different latitudes and, and it starts off in the so-called Atacama Desert and it ends right there close to Cape Horn and and the uh, passing through uh, thousands of little islands and and uh, and glaciers and and uh, and um, 600 miles away from Antarctica. Now, the average uh, width of, of, the, of the country is just about 110 miles. 
And it is the second longest in South America. Brazil beats uh, Chile for just about 57 miles. And if you superimpose uh, Chile's over uh, northern uh, North America, look at that. Mexico, it would go from, it would stretch from uh, Canada, you know, all the way down to Mexico City. So the 2,600 miles, it is, it is the length of the country, which is almost equivalent to the width of the United States. So it's really, really long, all right? Now, um, it, it goes again from uh, parallel 17th with, with our neighboring countries of Bolivia and Peru, as you can see and check out on the right map. Uh, and, the, and, the, um, and it ends on 56 uh, latitude, that's Cape Horn. Cape Horn belongs to Chile, and that's exactly where the country, continental Chile, ends. All right, let's take a look at Narrow's point. I have a question for you all. How narrow do you think Chile is? There you are, a highlighted uh, area in red over the left side, and then zoomed in a uh, kind of um, map that shows uh, the exact location. It's right above Iyapel. You see the bottom, take a look at the bottom part of the uh, of the map and is it 20 miles? Is it 50 miles? Is it 100 miles, 150? What is it? It is just 56 miles wide. It is really, really narrow. And that's the narrowest point as, as I mentioned before. Now, um, we are uh, very, uh, you know, uh, our history is very related to mining. Mining, as a matter of fact, is our main income, the main activity of, of, of for, for, the, for the country. 40% um, of the copper world reserves are found in this country, in Chile, 40%. That's a huge number. And of course, we got many uh, copper mines. One of them is the, uh, the largest open pit copper mine in the northern part, but we have this other one that has something really, really interesting. It's the world's biggest underground copper mine. It's called El Teniente. And in relation to Santiago, you see where the red star is, that's exactly where it is, up in the Andes range. And here is a picture of it in, in, uh, in, in uh, one evening of, of autumn time. Beautiful. And uh, now, it has about 1,800 miles of underground drifts. That's really amazing. And there is one of the, the constructions, you know, or one of the galleries of, or drifts to tunnels being constructed right there. And Chile is 26 miles long, as we said and learned already. And these tunnels are more than 1,800 miles long. And that's quite remarkable. A work that's been done for more than 100 years. And um, let's just keep in mind this uh, episode uh, of the miners that took place already 11 years ago in 2010 at the, mina, at the mine of San Jose. So you can see in relation to Santiago, and this is the distance more or less is about, I'm gonna say a thousand miles from, from, from where we are, from where I am. And I'm gonna just go ahead and play the video that will bring you fresh you know, uh, memories probably of this a world's event. There we go. It all began shortly after midnight local time as a rescue engineer strapped into the 26 inch wide escape capsule named Phoenix 2 and then began the still unproven man trip below. 2,040 feet down a shaft through some of the hardest rock on earth. 17 minutes, 22 seconds later, first contact. No! It worked on the way down, and soon, as a billion viewers around the world watched the image like a transmission from the moon, 31-year-old Florenzio Avalos would prove with this first trip to the surface, the capsule worked both ways. At 11 minutes after midnight, as Florenzio was the first to end this 70-day crisis, his son, 7-year-old Byron, touched everyone's hearts. Up next, 39-year-old Mario Sepulveda. When he cleared the escape pod, his celebration thrilled a nation. He surprised Chile's president and rescuers with souvenirs, pieces of rock from the cave-in. His energy belying a man trapped in a mine for more than two months. They now call him Super Mario. He hugged and kissed just about everyone. 
Yeah, I hope you all remember this uh, this uh, world ep episode and uh, and, uh, and the world's eyes were actually fixed on what was going on. We got a lot of help from many countries, including the U.S., to to drill the the shaft all the way down to uh, to rescue final of the miners. That's a miracle, a truly a miracle. All right, let's move on into something different. Um, did you know we have uh, uh, two um, Nobel Prize uh, winners? Well, there you are. Pablo Neruda, it might actually ring the bell better than Gabriela Mistral, so a man and a woman. And we're gonna uh, just uh, talk about a bit about Pablo Neruda, whose um, you know, uh, life uh, has been pretty active politically as well. He became ambassador of, of Chile in Mexico and lived in the exile right before the military coup in, in 1970s. And, uh, but more importantly, it's to know that he received uh, the um, the uh, uh, Nobel Prize of Literature in 1971, 1971. And years uh, earlier, this lady here, Gabriela Mistral, did the same. So, um, and she became a very, very important woman um, to the country and, and um, received uh, the prize in literature as well, Nobel Prize in 1945 and defended uh, the woman's right and also children's right. And, uh, you know, I highly recommend to get to uh, any book on Gabriela Mistral or Pablo Neruda. Now, this is something really hilarious. Guess what? The moon is mine. What do I mean by this? The moon is Chilean. How come? Yeah, back in 1954, this guy, Gennaro Gajardo Vera, occurred this crazy idea. He was a lawyer uh, of entering into notary in Santiago and uh, ask uh, to, uh, to, the, to, to the lawyers to, to uh, register the moon under his name. You know, no one, he said to himself, no one's ever claimed the moon. So it doesn't belong to any nation, nation around the world, any specific man or, or, or organization. So why not? I'm just gonna go ahead and just send a precedent, you know, in, in this matter. And the legend says that, that uh, the president, president Nixon actually went ahead and asked uh, Gennaro Gajardo Vera for his permission to, uh, to land the, the Apollo on, on the moon and let the astronauts to walk on it. But anyways, it's part of the, the legend. Nobody knows really whether that was true or not, but that's quite hilarious. The moon is Chilean, believe it or not. So this also has a connection with the moon. As you can read there, it shows July 20th. Dia del amigo. So if you know what amigo means, amigo is friend. So July 20th in Argentina, we celebrate the Friends Day. The other picture says, the friends are the family that we choose. And I agree 100%. I cannot think of my life without my friends. But what's the connection with the moon? Well, July 20th, 1969, the astronauts reached the moon, but that was a team from Soviet Union at that time and United States. So an Argentine that was watching the news, he said, oh my God, these two countries are enemies right now. And they could accomplish this mission. They could work together. So it, this is a great proof that friendship among all nations can exist. So he started writing letters, but thousands and thousands that he sent to different people in the world. And this is what he wrote. I consider the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon as a friendly gesture of humanity towards the universe. And I also think that a nation of friends would be an invincible nation. Because of that, July 20th is the chosen day. So that's part of the story. That's true that for us, July 20th, even though it's not a holiday, it's one of the most important days of the year. It's as important as Mother's Day that you just celebrated in the US and Chile or Father's Day. So every year, if it's during the week, you would maybe gather in the evening so that you can see your friends and, and have a beer or a coffee. And even sometimes it gets so busy that cell phone networks can collapse during the day because of all the people trying to reach and talk to their friends. So very important day for us. Now, why did I put these psychologists in here? 
And that's because Argentina has this record of being the country in the world with the highest number of psychologists per capita. So this past summer, this TV news program was showing this uh, study and they said that we have 222 psychologists every 100,000 inhabitants. So they were asking themselves, are we all crazy? My friends in Chile and my husband, they don't really understand that this is more like a habit that we go to the psychologist in Argentina. So on that world's map, they were showing with lighter to darker colors how many psychologists every 100,000 inhabitants. So for example, US, it's between 20 and 100. So the bottom part of the list, the darkest color was just Argentina. So I believe that psychologists will never be unemployed in my country. You always have something to talk about. So you really enjoy going and see your psychologist. Now it became like virtual, but um, yes, it's uh, something pretty special and maybe unique, I should say, but we love going to the psychologist. And many young people after high school, they study this career. Now let's talk a bit about sports. If I show you this first picture, you know what I'm talking about. Those are the two most famous and important teams of soccer that we call football. And this is how we spell it in Argentina. This is definitely number one most popular sport in my country. And I should say in South America too. But what if I tell you that even though it's so popular, it's not the national sport. So that next picture that you see, if I ask you like, what's this sport? In general, the, the answer I get is polo. Well, there are some rules that they are similar to polo. You ride horses, that's true too. But if you pay attention, the guy in the middle has a ball with handles. So this is Argentina's national sport and it's called pato. Pato means duck. And that's because many years ago when this sport started, it was played by the gauchos that are like our cowboys in the estancias, in the ranches. And they used to play the sport with a duck that could be alive or not inside a basket. So in the 50s, one of our famous presidents, Perón, he declared pato as a national sport in the country. But I have to tell you that about 90% of the people in Argentina have never ever played pato or have never ever watched a pato game, but it's still the national sport in my country. Okay, let's uh, change the subject completely and go from sports into something more uh more uh, more cultural i would say and uh, that is found in the northern part of the country of chile and it's about this uh, small um group or civilization uh known as chinchorro and um they have they actually developed this incredible mummification um method and um and it is what is it's even more amazing is to think that this uh this these uh, chinchorro mummies are actually uh, 2000 older than Egyptians. And uh, I'm going to play you a video. And these are pre Columbian civilization. That means before Columbus arrival to the Americas. So I'm going to play a video, but I need you to pay attention because there's information that's going to be displayed on it so, from now on. Oops. So Chilean scientists have found traces of that culture from the south of Peru to Antofagasta region in Northern Chile. The dryness of this area has contributed to their preservation. These mummies are remains that help us to understand this rich culture. That was especially concerned with preserving the bodies of their deceased ones. An important part of this heritage is displayed in the San Miguel de Azapa Archaeological Museum in Erika, an archaeological treasure from Chile to the world. Quite amazing. I bet you were not expecting to, to hear anything about it, right? Okay, how about this? Alma, if you know a little Spanish, uh, Alma stands for soul. 
However, it's completely different here. It stands for epic comma large millimeter or submillimeter array. What is this? It's high up in the Andes range and it's the largest ground-based based astronomical project in existence. It is a single telescope of revolutionary design composed of 66 high precision antennas located in Northern Chile at 16,500 feet of altitude. All right, now, ALMA is an international partnership. So Europe, US, Japan, Canada, Taiwan, and the Republic of Korea are part of it in cooperation with the Republic of Chile. And now I'm going to play uh, a short video. It's a time-lapse video, but pay attention to the skies instead. Uh, and and uh, you're gonna see the antenna has been rotating and, and everything, but, um, but uh, take a look at the, uh, of the skies. You could probably see the Milky Way, uh, some of the brightest stars in, in, in the Southern constellation. Here we go. Chile has one of the cleanest skies in the world. And this is pretty high up in the Andes, above uh, 16,000 feet of elevation. And not the only one astronomical center, but def definitely the largest and the most important in the world. The first observation was uh, took place in 2011, actually. And, uh, but the first image images were released in 2014. Now let's move on into something uh, uh, quite incredible, quite remarkable. 2,900 volcanoes are counted in Chile. Yes, 2,900 volcanoes. 500 of, of them are active. And uh, 60 uh, have actually experienced eruptions in the last 450 years. That is equivalent to 50% of the world's active volcanoes are found in this country. Amazing, right? If you'll take a look at the map on the left, you'll see where the, the volcanoes are concentrated, basically in the central southern portion of the country. Now, uh, in the same area, in the central southern portion, uh, some, I would say, 600 miles from where I am in Santiago, and there you are at the map on the right, shows this place called Valdivia. It's a very, very beautiful place, very beautiful city um, of a German uh, immigrants. And May 22nd, 1960, so in just about 10 days time, we're going to be celebrating another anniversary of what? Of the great Chilean earthquake. The most powerful earthquake ever recorded took place in Moldavia city with a magnitude of 9.5 in Richter scale. Yes, 9.5. So it lasted for approximately 10 minutes. Just try to imagine what that was like. And there is a picture, one of the many pictures that shows, you know, the devastation caused by, uh, by the earthquake. Uh, the tremors caused localized tsunamis that severely battered the chilling coast with waves up to 82 feet, all right? There is another picture that shows uh, the, the city of, of Valdivia and the main river that crosses it. This is the main, the main tsunami, tsunami traveled across the entire Pacific Ocean and devastated Hilo in Hawaii. Now, Ojos del Salado, that could be translated into the, the, the eyes of the salty one. Um, it's uh, not only um, in the Andes uh, range be, located in the border between Chile and Argentina, but it is the highest active volcano in the world with more than 22,000 feet. And it's the second highest mountain in the Americas. And, it's, and, and of course the highest in Chile. Uh, to climb it, it's rather uh, easy, except for the last stretch to reach the summit, where um, specific gear is it's, it's required. It's mandatory. There you are, Ojos del Salado. Now, the Atacama Desert, where that volcano is located, by the way, it's the driest desert in the world, as we learned already. And you see on that little map over the left, uh, Bolivia and Peru do share part of, uh, uh, of it as well. The Atacama Desert, uh, it stretches for about 600 miles from Southern Peru into Northern Chile. Officially, it's the driest on earth. 
right? And some weather stations in the desert have never recorded a single drop of rain. And the northern, northern coastal area, though, receive a little more rainfall because of the influence of the Pacific Ocean. And also because of the torrential uh, rainfall that takes place in the higher part of Bolivia, like every three to five years, we get this. You know, beautiful patches of, of flowering, uh, what we call flowering desert. Yeah, it is amazing. How come? You know, we got, of course, this... Uh, these uh, uh, rainfall water uh, bringing and carrying and seeds and down into the some parts of the desert and like like I said before, uh, every so three to five years uh, you get something like this a blooming blooming flowering desert just like that incredible. Now, the world countries with active geysers fields are Russia, New Zealand, Iceland, U.S. and Chile too. So we have uh, our own geysers, we call them tatio, and they're above 16,000 feet of elevation. There it is, not much of infrastructure, and, but um, you need to get up early in the morning around 3, 30, 4 o'clock, then uh, drive for about two hours, uh, get acclimated a little bit. It's freezing temperatures and with the, the first uh, uh, sun rays of the day, of course, you get the, the, uh, the action, the geysers in action. Now, this is something probably uh, people know, uh, and maybe you don't know if they belong to Chile, but they do. Isla de Pascua, and um, it's, or Rapa Nui, it's located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, belongs to the, the Polynesian Triangle, so therefore it has a Polynesian origin, and it's five hours flight, yes, you heard correctly, five hours flight from Santiago, and, um, and it's, uh, it's a quite remarkable culture. Uh, the island itself has a triangle shape. There's like uh, this number of volcano craters uh, there in the island, uh, three uh, large ones, one in each corner coincidentally. And um, it's an interesting culture, uh, gastronomy activities, but um, the, 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 the reason why the Isla de Pascua or Rapa Nui Island is so well known around the world is because of the Moai, the so-called Moais, uh, which um, it stands for a statue and uh, they're made, made out of volcanic stone uh, and they represent the islanders and um, ancestors. And of course, there are several different sites, and that's one of the, the largest ones in, in, in the entire island. This one, for instance, is, is the 15 Moais altogether in Ahu Tongariki. Ahu, it's a local word that stands for platform, in which you see all of these Moais standing. This is quite amazing to see sunrise and sunsets, for instance, with, with this. It's just a breathtaking uh, landscape. So I highly recommend to visit Easter Island and learn more about the culture there. So as you could see, we left what we like the most, that is wildlife, landscapes, um, mountains for the last part of our presentation. So these last few slides, well, this is a combined because this is something that you can find in Argentina and Chile. Carlos will play the video because this little guy here is the smallest deer in the world. We are playing the video that was sent by some of our friends. Both of us would love to see one of these pudu. So these two friends of ours were driving in Southern Chile, specifically in an island that is called Chiloé, and they were lucky enough to find a pudu. So in South America, the two smallest years are pudu, Northern pudu in Northern South America, and the Southern pudu for both of our countries, Argentina and Chile in the South is where you can find it. The name Pudu comes from the Mapuche language. The Mapuches are the natives in both Argentina and Chile's southern parts. And as you can read down below, uh, they can be from 13 up to 17 inches tall and 33 inches long. They are protected, especially if they live in many of our national parks. We try to protect them. There are not too many. And uh, the southern Pudu has a special category that it's near threatened. So I would love to see one of these little deer. Also going on with wildlife, I wanna tell you about this is something very special and unique. You can see the map of Argentina and there's a place marked on the map that is called Valdez Peninsula. Valdez Peninsula is Northeast part of our region of Patagonia. And that's where March, April and September 
if you go there and you are lucky enough, you can observe this special behavior of the orcas. It's called the orcas beaching technique. They are the only ones that developed such a dangerous hunting technique, and it's been registered for the first time in 1974. We will show you bigger the map of this place, Valdez Peninsula. Um, it's like a wildlife sanctuary in Argentina. So there are different species of wildlife, but I circled in red the places where we can see the orcas. So I'll show you two pictures so that I can explain you better this technique. The orcas swim towards the beach and they left two thirds of their bodies exposed, as you can see on this picture, with the risk, of course, of getting stranded because they are heavy um, and the waves just keep on moving. So the main reason why they do this, it's because they wanna prey on this little uh, pups of the sea uh, of the seals. So in this case, once they can catch their prey, they have to slide back towards the ocean with dorsal movements. But it's such a specific technique that females in the pot of orcas there, they teach to the younger generations. So the people studying this orcas behavior, they gave a name uh, for each of these orcas. And you need to be very patient. I still wanna go there. I've been there many times, but never for the orca season. I have a friend who recently visited that place, Valdez Peninsula, one month ago. And he was for five days waiting to spot the orcas in a certain place. And day number five, he was lucky to see it. So it's pretty amazing, the orcas beaching technique. Now we will talk about one of my favorite places in Argentina, Iguazu Falls. That's how we say it. It's a place that we share with our neighbors in Brazil. These are considered to be the widest falls in the world. There are 275 individual falls. And if you put them all together, it's a width of 9,000 feet. We'll see some other pictures. Um, the pictures that you see are from the Argentinian side. There's a system of boardwalks. So you take a little train, you get off at a station and you start walking in the middle of the jungle to get to see uh, close up views of each fall. On the next photo, you will see that we also offer some boat rides. So the river you see in the middle of this photo, it's Iguazu River. The border between Argentina and Brazil goes through that river. So the falls are shared, like I said, and those boat rides take you, as you can see, almost right under the fall. It's called the Great Adventure. It's just amazing. Uh, a few more uh, facts about the Iguazu Falls came on the next slide. The National Park in Argentina was opened in 1934. And um, UNESCO declared this place as a World Heritage Site and also it was um, said that it has an exceptional universal value. In the year 2011, when you were visiting both sites in Argentina and Brazil, the people could vote to choose this place as one of the new seven wonders of nature. And after a long time, this finally happened. So this has now a new award, let's say. So it's one of the new seven wonders. And I'd like to play this video that we took from the Argentinian side in a place that is called the Devil's Throat. So as you can see, every time I go there, to me, it's breathtaking. I cannot believe all the water uh, that you have running right under your feet. So the Devil's Throat is also shared between Argentina and Brazil, which you are looking across. It's the Brazilian side. Uh, and it's just a really spectacular place that we have in Argentina. So I highly recommend if you are not there and you have the chance to come to go because it's worth a visit. Now, something that I can compare with uh, Route 66 in the US, I've been there once. It's our national road number 40. As you can see on the map, the road goes all along the west side of Argentina, 
And the only place where it touches the Atlantic Ocean or the eastern side, it's in the bottom. It's in uh, Patagonia, the southern part of my country. So it goes from that area where it's sea level all along the west. And in some parts, it reaches more than 16,000 feet of altitude. So this road crosses 20 national parks, 18 major rivers, and 27 mountain passes in the Andes. This is still on my bucket list together with my dad to drive all this national road number 40. So every time I'm driving a little part of it when I'm working, I buy some souvenirs for him so that we always keep in mind that we still have to make this dream come true. So all sorts of souvenirs that they would have the number 40 um, that you can easily buy in different parts. These were all bought in Patagonia, the Southern region, but it goes, as you can see, all along to the Northern side, uh, right where we um, neighbor with Bolivia. So what I will show you on the next slide, you can reach this place if you take national road number 40. It's a little town that is called Purmamarca. I've been there a couple of times and it's just uh, gorgeous because of the colors. This mountain that you can see at the very end of a little narrow street in Purmamarca town is called Cerro de los Siete Colores, the Seven Colors Hill, but it's locally known as the Hill of the Seven Skirts because those colors, the sediment colors in the mountains, they resemble the colorful skirts that the native women and local women wear. So the name of the province in Argentina, the northernmost is Jujuy. Um, the next photo will show you another wonderful postcard. That's me when I was there opening my arms, just enjoying those colors. The contrast with the blue sky, I could not believe it. It was just a magical visit. And in the same province, but maybe it's not like so, so visited, you can find one that has 14 colors. So the 14 colors hill in Jujuy, it really looks like a painting. It's not really popular or, or advertised by companies because Argentina is a pretty big country. So you need to choose specific places when you are coming in general, people spend two weeks. So sometimes there's not enough time to go. But if you are coming for a second or a third time, I really recommend that you take time to discover Northwest Argentina. And now we are almost reaching the end. So let's talk a bit about our mountains. Uh, this is Mount Aconcagua. And we'll play this video that Carlos could take in one of our many flights from Buenos Aires into Santiago de Chile. Only when you do this route and you have a right a window seat, if the day is clear, you can see the Aconcagua. The Aconcagua is the highest mountain of all the Americas. As you can read on the slide, it's almost 7,000 meters or almost 23,000 feet. It's the second highest after the Himalaya system in Asia. And it's part of the famous Andes mountain range um, that is like the natural and official border between our two countries. So the border between Argentina and Chile is about 3,300 miles long. This makes our border the third longest in the world after the one between US and Canada and the one between Russia and Kazakhstan. So the mountains, this and this range that is the longest continental range in the world is 4,300 miles long from Venezuela all along the west side of South America until it reaches Tierra del Fuego, Fireland Island in, uh, in Argentina and Chile. So those are our mountains. The mountains that even though they are the border between the two countries, they also connect Argentina and Chile. And for the last part of the presentation, I just wanna share with you something very personal. We decided like almost two years ago to bring Argentina and Chile a little closer and we got married. So these are some of the pictures of that special day. So we are a binational couple. That was our cake topper when we did our celebration with friends and family. And with this personal little story, we wanna finish our presentation about Argentina and Chile. 
some of the sources and credit from where we got uh, information and photos for this presentation. Uh, we want to thank Mara once more and thanks all of you for being there. We call ourselves passionate guides. So if you want to know, know more about Argentina and Chile, you can check our webpage. And with this, again, we want to thank you from deep inside our hearts for your attention and for being there on the other side in such a special time for us and for all of you. Thank you. We want to thank you all. You are wonderful. And I have to say the light that shined on Carlos's face when you talked about your marriage was priceless. <laughs> so it, it is so nice to see that she lights you up just as much today as on that day of your wedding. Um, Carlos, I know that you have to go because you have some other plans and I do thank you very much for coming on today and I know that you know you have to run so I'm going to let you say your goodbyes, but Laura will stay on for the Q&A. Yes, yes, I just wanted to once again thank you Mara for the opportunity. It's been wonderful to reconnect again with your audience and I hope uh, everybody has uh, enjoyed the presentation and learned a bit about both countries and, uh, and, and, our, and, and, and this marriage. This is my, my, my national marriage. marriage. <laughs> so thank you so much. Hugs to you all and, and, and be well. Stay healthy. Thank you. That's great. Take care. Okay, so Carlos is going to jump off. I do want to say thank you to everybody for coming today. Um, I know that many of you struggled to get in and my apologies the only thing i could think of is maybe the email broke the link because it was so long and it wasn't clickable so i appreciate your tenacity and the fact that you kept with it and you tried hard to get on and hopefully for your friends that weren't here we are recording this and we will post it just like we do um, each week and they'll be able to view it afterwards but thank you so much i know this was sort of like a, a pop-up and we did it very quickly so thanks so much for being flexible and jumping on to this presentation laura um i know you uh just took a drink so i'm hoping that you're ready to get into yes. this q a before we get in i i just changed the slide so people can see if you are um if you are thinking of uh doing a tip there are several ways i will not be sending a follow-up email because quite honestly i don't know who's on because it wasn't a registered event so please take a note of the slide and and tip um in the means that you're comfortable with and if you don't have the means to tip we completely understand that um if you're interested in physical tours i did put a list of my tours up that i'm going to be doing in the next few years so if you are looking to travel with a fun group by all means drop me an email and ask me about some of those tours and uh back to you laura if you're ready i will uh sort of go behind you and we'll address some of these questions yes perfect so i will try to start from the beginning i was trying to read some of the questions why carlos was um um, talking. The, the first thing I want to say is that this was not like a touristic presentation. We just wanted to share with you some cool facts, interesting information that maybe you didn't know. We hope in the future, and if you like our presentations, that we can put together something that it's more like touristic so that we can give you recommendations or show you the main places where you can go. That's why I was going through some of the um, uh, questions and we did not talk about every single region and where you can go if you want to visit okay so yes, I just we do to have we do have Argentina um in the planning so we look to have Argentina on our list in the early fall so we are looking at that to be more like a virtual tour presentation where we do a journey from place to place and learn about the places yes, exactly thank you Mara so uh, why 9th of July Avenue? Uh, 9th of July is our Independence Day, which is pretty close to the US Independence Day. So that happened in Argentina in the year 1816. So that's the reason why the main avenue in Buenos Aires was named after our Independence Day. Uh, does mate have caffeine? Well, yes, it has a sort of caffeine that we call matein. So that's why it's good like for like students. I remember when I was studying tourism and if I had to stay awake all night, uh, I don't like coffee a lot, so I could drink mate. So sometimes it helped me to stay awake. Some other times if I was too tired, it didn't work, but it has a sort of a caffeine in it and also some other properties that are good for the health. But to be honest, we don't really drink mate because of the properties that the herbs have. 
it's a habit, it's a tradition, it's an acquired taste. In general, when we ask foreigners to try it, the, you have to see faces when the people try mate for the first time. Nobody really likes it, but it's a habit that we uh, have and, and we enjoy. And it's more the fact that we want to share. That's why now it got so complicated with the, with the pandemic, because each person would have a mate cup. Before the pandemic, we could share the same straw, even though I understand it's kind of weird and not too many people um, would love to do that. Um, let me see, I had, uh, that's the widest river in the world always look so brown? Yes, and that's because all the other rivers that they flow into this estuary, they come basically from Northeast Argentina and also from parts of Uruguay. They carry a lot of sediments. If you remember, there's a connection between the De La Plata River and the Iguazu Falls, that was the end of the presentation. In general, when you see the, the Iguazu Falls, it has the same brown color. The um, soil in the falls area contains a lot of iron. So it's kind of reddish brownish. And all those sediments are, are carried by the different rivers and then it flows into this main De La Plata. So that's the color that we see every single day. Uh, some parts like closer to the city can be polluted, of course, but an hour away from Buenos Aires city, you can get to the Delta. There are islands in the middle of the river and many people from the city, they have their weekend houses in there. So in summer that is very hot, you can swim in those brown waters of the Delta, of the De La Plata River. Um, the significance of 9th of July, I answered that already. Uh, did I miss a description of how Chile and Argentina established their borders? No, we didn't get into any like historic facts, but I can briefly tell you that, like I mentioned before, the mountains were always like a natural border between the two countries. Imagine that they are really high, so it's not easy to cross and imagine in the past. But uh, one of the main years talking about borders was 1881. That was a time when one president from Chile and one from Argentina discussed the idea of borders and they signed a border treaty. So basically what we use to divide, let's say, is a watershed that runs through the highest peaks of the Andes range. Um, the, the thing is that, of course, both countries did not agree 100% the southernmost part because we share glaciers. So the whole landscape is covered by ice. It was very hard to decide on those parts. And also uh, the southernmost part, I mentioned Tierra del Fuego or Fireland Island that we share with Chile. The mountains in all the southern part of Chile are divided into many different tiny islands and fjords. So it wasn't easy to follow one mountain range in there. So we almost, fought a war against Chile in 1978 because of the southernmost borders. Luckily, that war never started. We were ready, but the Pope had to intervene and he sent uh, a cardinal that was kind of mediating and he helped both countries to get to an agreement. So we signed like a friendship and peace treaty, let's call it like that. So it was finally decided, but imaginary lines, parallels and meridians are the borders between Argentina and Chile in the southernmost part. That's briefly how can I explain it in a, in a fast way. Uh, how long do people usually take to do the Route 40 road trip at a leisurely pace? Well, that's up to you because um, imagine that from like Buenos Aires, it, anyway, Buenos Aires is not on the national road number 40, but you know, same latitude. If you wanna go from there to the south, it can take average two days, two days and a half, like just stopping to rest. So it would be five days to connect northernmost part with southernmost parts, almost like nonstop. So if you just want to enjoy, you can take as long as you want. You can take a month, two months. It's so beautiful what you would see along the road that you have to really plan it in advance. Also, you have to pay attention because not every single part of the road is paved. 
some little parts are still gravel. And um, in many parts, especially in the south, you need to check how far is your next gas station. Because sometimes you drive, you drive, and you are in the middle of nowhere. So those are things you can consider. Then you have to take into account like how much time you have and choose like which would be the longest part of the road that you can do to take your time and enjoy what's on the road. That, that would be my suggestion. How many hours from B8 to Santiago? Uh, I think you're talking about a flight. It's a two hours flight. That can be sometimes hour and a half. When you, you check online, it's in general two hours, two hours and 15 minutes, the flight from one city to the other. If, you, if you're talking about driving, it's a long way because you have to cross the Andes. And even though sometimes we see the Andes range as just a line on the map, they are pretty wide and you have to cross the mountains and tunnels through the mountains to get to be uh, on the other side. Of course, now borders are closed, so we can't do that. Uh, can you tour the Capichitas mine? Uh, I know that you can kind of go by the entrance. There are little tour companies in the area because Catamarca, the province where the mine is located, is not even touristic for Argentinians to go. So not too many people really go there, even though beautiful landscapes they have. So I read that you can tour the area. There's even a hotel right outside the mine where you can stay overnight, but I haven't read that you can go inside the mine. Of course, the guides will explain the whole process. They will show you where to do it. And of course they will offer you to buy some souvenirs, but I haven't read that you can go really inside the mine. Mm -hmm. Uh, how many hours from one end of Chile to the other? Again, that's more or less similar to saying than um, uh, how long it would take to do national road number 40 because it's more or less the same length. But in Chile, it's even more challenging because of the islands. There's a certain part in southern, southern Chile that the road stops and all you have to cross into Argentina to drive on a road and then cross again back into Chile a little bit farther south, or you have to take your car into small ferry boats to cross from island to island. So it's really like a challenge. So I cannot really give you a, a, a specific answer about how long it, it would take to drive from the northernmost part to the southernmost part. Are there a lot of fake injected color of the rose colored stones on the market? How can you tell real ones from fake ones? Uh, I never really encounter fake ones, um, so I don't think it's really easy to fake the color of the rhodochrosite or Inca rose. Um, and you can find some really good deals. I mean, there are some huge stores, fancy ones, but then you go to the, like I said before, in many neighborhoods of Buenos Aires, there are artisans markets or fairs during weekends. And many people, they work with the stone. And you can buy some cool pieces of jewelry that they are original, but of course, uh, much cheaper than in the, any of the fancy stones, uh, stores, I'm sorry. Uh, a decade ago, there were a few old Supe subway wooden cars in A line. Are they still working? Unfortunately, they are not. They were getting too... Uh, like damaged and it was dangerous to keep on using those cards. So I think 2013 was the last um, year when those were used and they have been already replaced 100% by modern new cards. But yes, A-Line, we used to take people when they were in Buenos Aires, just like to go from the first station to the second one so that they could see and they could use these all wooden cars. But unfortunately, not anymore. Um, is it true that Chilean wine started with wine grape from France? Yes, I think Carlos mentioned that. Same with Argentina, but the special thing about Chile because Malbec wine is produced in some other countries in the world, but Carmener, this grape that was originally from France, it was wiped out uh, in there and suddenly it was found in Chile. They first thought it was a different uh, grape. And when it, they found out that it was Carmener, uh, they said, okay, Carmenaris is still alive. So now that's the pure Chilean wine. Uh, so I think that's what you are 
uh, talking about. Um, let me see. Can you tell us how you are surviving COVID? <laughs> well, uh, I think we are doing pretty well, um, but I can tell, I, I believe the majority of you are from the US, so where you are doing much better than us right now. Chile is one of the countries that uh, deal really well with vaccination. In fact, Carlos got his second uh, Pfizer shot today, so he was very happy. So they have already more than 50% of the population who got a shot. And uh, yesterday was my turn in Chile because I live there, but I'm in Buenos Aires, so I couldn't. On the other hand, and now um, number of positive cases per day are uh, decreasing in Chile. So that's really good. And Santiago, the capital, will leave the quarantine during the week. So they will just have like freedom during the week. And during weekends, they still have quarantine. So in Chile, uh, if it's the quarantine, you have to get a permit online on your cell phone to go to grocery store, for example. And they give you that permit for two hours and just two permits per week. In Argentina, it's different. Uh, the government promised too many vaccines in December. That never happened. So many people have one shot but less than, I think, 3% of the whole population of Argentina already got the second shot. The other thing is that the main vaccines we got here is one Chinese. My dad had his second Chinese shot last week. And the other one is AstraZeneca and a Russian vaccine. The problem with the Russian vaccine is that many people like my mother got the first shot. But the second shot, I don't know really how to explain this, but it has a different component than the first one. And it looks, it looks it's hard for Russia to produce a second shot. So we are not getting it. So we don't know when the people who got the first shot more than a month ago will be able to get the second one. And cases are still increasing. Argentina is going through the peak since the pandemic started right now. So borders have been closed for more than a year. For the first time in the last month, we are having a curfew from 8 p.m. until 5 a.m. And you can go out during the day without a permit. It's not like in Chile. And uh, like meetings or reunions of more than 10 people are not allowed. So that's what I can tell you. It's hard. Sometimes it looks like it's never ending, but we still have some faith and hope and especially because we work in tourism and tourism will be the last business to stand up. So we really hope we can fight this pandemic and that it will soon be over. So that's what I can tell you about that. Uh, somebody just checked Alfajores into, in Amazon. Yeah, I've heard that in the US they are pricey. It always depends on the brands. I know there's a place, I don't know these guys, but I have a friend, Argentinian friend who lives in the US. So I know that she buys some Argentinian products uh, in a website that is called like Malambo, M-A-L-A-M-B-O, Malambo. Um, I think that's the name of the place where they can get Argentinian products. Uh, let me see, it goes so fast. What is a, a drift in copper mines? I understand those are the kind of those kind of tunnels uh, that they have inside, like the mountain or underground, to get to extract the, the copper. Um, let me see some of them are comments. Um, this I answered already. Let me go to the bottom. What's in uh, Tierra del Fuego, well, Tierra del Fuego is a place where I lived for 15 years. So Tierra del Fuego means fireland and it's an island, a big island that is shared between Argentina and Chile. That would be the archipelago that, that it's part of the southern tip of South America before reaching Antarctica. So you have um, more than half of the island is a flat landscape that looks like a desert where there's sheep, raising and then the Guanacos, the llamas live there. And the southern part of Tierra del Fuego is where the mountains are, part of the Andes range. So there are some towns and uh, that's where cruise ships go to, the ones that depart 
to go to Antarctica, but also these large cruise ships that they go all around South America, the southernmost tip, they also sail through the waters of Tierra del Fuego. Tierra del Fuego Island is divided or separated from South American mainland by the Strait of Magellan, famous Strait of Magellan. Um, I have a question from Facebook. Yes. Um, is there an observation deck or area in Alma for visitors to go to see the stars? Um, I don't know if there's one specifically in Alma, but I've been in that part of Chile um, for a special training that we had. So several companies offered tours to see the stars. So they have like certified guides that they take uh, all the necessary equipment and they know about the stars. So the, 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 the skies are so clean that you don't really need to get to Alma, but in any small town of Chile, you just get a little bit far away from the town to prevent the lights to disturb your, your experience. So many parts of Northern Chile and even in Atacama, they don't take you to Alma, but many tours they take you, they wake you up really early in the morning and they take you and I've seen so many wonderful pictures that only guides from there know how to take mm -hmm. so that you can be in the picture and then you just see the sky and all the stars behind you. So about Alma, I'm not pretty sure if you can visit. I can double check with Carlos if you want. So if you want to leave with Mara an email, I can. Uh, I'm. I will be more than glad to to send you that the answer by email. Uh, is the Route 40 the one that continues up farther into Central America to U.S. and Canada to Alaska? I think that what Anne is talking about is the famous Pan American Highway. Uh, National Road 40 is not part of the Pan American Highway even though Pan American Highway is just any connection of roads that you just put together to go through all America. But in the case of Argentina, um, we usually take the other side of the country, the eastern side of the country, it's part of the Pan American Highway. So it goes from the bottom part of uh, Tierra del Fuego all the way through South America. And I think it reaches like Fairbanks in Alaska, if I'm not wrong, maybe even farther north. So that's the yeah, Pan American Highway. Um, let me see. Can you Can talk about the cost of living in, in both Argentina and Chile? And are they different or are they pretty much the same? And, and like, give us a idea of maybe a dinner out, a rent in an apartment or something of that nature. Yeah, well, if you ask Argentinians for many years, we had this concept that Chile was very cheap. What you have to know about Argentina is that we struggle a lot with economy, always, not just during the pandemic. And for us, even though we do have a currency that is the Argentinian peso, is not strong at all. So we trust more in your US dollars than in our own currency. So the inflation rate is really high. And that's why many years we always looked at Chile like it's a really stable country. So if we go there, it was, it used to be very cheap. Now that I'm living in Santiago de Chile, I can tell you that some things are not as cheap as Argentinians think. So the problem of the two countries is that for you know working class, you earn money when you work, but that money is not enough to live with your salary for a month. And many people, they cannot dream of having your own apartment or house. So now in Argentina, it's getting very expensive. But when I mention expensive, it's when I think about our currency. So maybe you go out and if I tell you the price in US dollars, you would believe it's a bargain. It's almost free because we have a huge difference in the exchange rate. And we have an official market and a blue or unofficial market for the dollar. So the unofficial market right now is that one US dollar in Argentina, it's equal to 150 pesos. So sometimes you can pay $5 and go to a really nice place for a meal. 
So five dollars maybe in US, I don't know. I can maybe it's not enough to go to a McDonald's. So it's it's such a huge difference when you think about the different currencies that it's really hard for us right now. Um, we are always these past years. Every year at the end of the year, Argentina is reaching uh, between 40 and 50% of inflation at the end of the day. So it's like, even though maybe your salary can increase once a year, it's never enough. You are always running behind the inflation rate. Chile has no inflation. Sometimes it's 2% or 3% annually. And I can tell you because I do grocery shopping, and I'm surprised because in Argentina, if I go every Friday, the price of the same product keeps changing and increasing. But in Chile, it's always the same. Last year, I paid for the same, I don't know, let's say cream cheese that I buy in the supermarket, same price one year ago than now. But still, people struggle in Chile. So in Argentina or in Buenos Aires, if I can compare the two main cities of the two countries, um, you have more options and some places can offer you a nice meal uh, and it would be the same kind of restaurant in Chile, more expensive. Chile has a currency that is a Chilean pesos and they use many zeros. So for example, I can tell you that 10,000 Chilean pesos is equal to 1414 dollars. So with with $14, you can have a very cheap uh, meal. Let's say you go for lunch and they offer like a, a menu with starter, main course and option that we do a lot that for lunch. So that would cost you $14. With $14 in Argentina, I'm just going from currency to currency with my calculator so that it's easier. You can have a, a nice meal uh, in a nicer restaurant. But it's very hard because the situation is so different for Northern Hemisphere and your countries. If we can compare with our countries, that it's getting pretty uh, difficult. Now with the pandemic, even worse than before. Mm -hmm. I have a good question to wrap up our section for today or our segment for yes. today. When you're in Chile, what do you miss the most about Argentina? And when you're in Argentina, what do you miss the most about Chile? Well, I would I can go with, you know, flavors or some products that I don't find, but that's like it's not something I mean I can live without that. And it's not like the, fair to say you miss Carlos when you're in Argentina. No, so you have to what go I was somewhere going to else. Say. <laughs> it's the people that I love that I miss a lot. You know, I I lived for 15 years in Tierra del Fuego, but I always had, thanks God, thanks to life, the economic possibility and also the time to come to see my friends and family in Buenos Aires every time I wanted. I wanted to come and surprise them for Christmas. I could do it. I was very lucky. So when I moved into Chile, I knew it was not going to be hard for me because of my job and my independence. I could come anytime I wanted to see them. But the main difference was the pandemic. I spent more, more than seven or eight months without being able to come here. So just to see face-to-face -face my family and my friends, that was the hardest part. It's great that we have Zoom, that we have cell phones, but it's not the same. You know, in Argentina, we are big huggers. We hug each other a lot. And I miss that part too much. So when I'm here, I really miss Carlos <laughs> because now after more than a year of being together 24 uh, seven, it's a challenge when we are not together. It was a big uh, challenge for our marriage because we both work a lot. So we don't see each other a lot during the high season for us that it's our spring and summer. So suddenly we were stuck at home 24 seven together and we survived so far. So I think it's been uh, mission accomplished. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much again, Laura. And, and please thank Carlos when you see him again. Uh, we, we so appreciate your time. I know this was a quick one to pull together and to present, but I think everybody enjoyed having a little bit of a pop-up uh, 
fun facts about Argentina and Chile. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Laura, and we will see you all next week. Take care and have thank a good all. night. Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much. Take care.